and there's another site dating to a couple hundred years later, um, Elora, which is cut out of the bedrock. It goes on for like two and a half kilometers, and it's all done in one go, and it's, again, beautifully ornate. It, from the floor to the ceiling, it's covered in, in inscriptions and uh, beautiful figures and statues. However, when you start to like analyze it on a more precise mathematical lens, um, it's all unpolished. The pillars are not aligned. They're all slightly different sizes. They start at different levels. The floor is not flat and the surfaces are uneven. So as amazing and spectacular as this site is, it doesn't even compare to when we're talking about the precision and the craftsmanship that appears over in Barabar. So this, when I first uh, showed people this, they're like, well, that, why are you showing me a picture of a machine? Like, what, what is this? This is a bird's eye view of the 3D scan rendering of uh, five of the Finnish caves. And it does look like some sort of part of a spaceship, but this is in fact the shapes that we are looking at inside those big whale backs. Um, and yeah, entirely carved of granite all in one go. So it's starting to look like something out of 2001 Space Odyssey in there. Um, and they've all got different names. I'm gonna run you through each of the caves because each cave is a completely unique shape. And at first, you think that they don't really correlate to each other or have anything to do with the other one, but the data that's coming out from when you analyze the stands and the sound machines, they are actually all connected in a certain way. They share geometric formulas, there's like hidden data, sound frequency plays a massive role in all of them, um, and they are actually connected and aligned to each other. So Gopika is one of the biggest and like most famous ones. It's, the chamber is entirely composed of curves, and which is really, really spectacular because in Egypt we get a lot of um, polished granite, like the, the boxes in the Serapium, if you're aware of them, which are amazing, but there's no curves involved in that. So that's a feat in itself, polishing granite vertically. But to add curvature, um, in there and precise curvature is a whole other deal um, for stonemasonry. And another thing that's amazing is the, is the polish. Now the guys told me when they went out to India the first time, they had real trouble actually filming the, the cave surfaces on cameras because to the human eye they could see it was like a kind of almost translucent glass polish finish. But when they got out a camera or they tried to film it, the, the translucent polish wasn't um, be able to be seen on the camera and they kept looking through to sort of the, the rough bedrock behind and it just didn't look right. So this time they went back and they bought um, a whole load of uh, shiny LED lights to, to really try and picture what the human eye can see inside this place on the camera and they were a bit more successful. Now, again, something that you couldn't see from the human eye but when you scan them, um, you can. They are symmetrical if you slice them lengthways and through the middle. And even some, um, they said that some, uh, it, yeah, so it's replicated to a, to a level that's super high. So it's about 70% perfectly symmetrical, but they also said because of this mirror polish, gonna get into, because of the mirror polish uh, it, inside the cave, it was actually throwing off the 3D scanner and they had to, this was a very conservative, um, level of data because the, it, was, it, was, it was knocking, the, the 3D scanning points was basically um, getting refracted and so they had to knock it down. So it's probably a bit more symmetrical than 70%, but they were giving very conservative numbers. And another thing that's super interesting is that the walls are not directly straight. They are all inclined just a little bit and exactly matching mirror image from one side to the other. 87 degrees on the wonk. And also at first you think, okay, well why, why is the entrance like not in the middle if it's all about symmetry? But when you look into the maths of the shape of the, of the volumes of the space, they actually, nothing is done by accident. Everything is designed precisely. Um, so here the entrance actually lines up to a circle um, from one end. So it, they, they were putting it in, in, not in the middle for a reason. And again, they took the data from the scans and they went back to some experts 
in France, um, had them analyzed, and they found some really interesting things, that the sphere of the, of the ceiling, the vaulted ceiling, was actually composed of a absolute, two absolute perfect spheres that you wouldn't even see two-thirds of it because it, it, the plan goes sort of into the bedrock. And so they were able, whoever designed these caves knew how to design spaces that would be created both above the ground and then the, the perfect sphere would continue under. And the volume of shape, again, is absolutely identical from one end to the other. So the, it looks, to my eyes, it looks like somebody has 3D CAD scanned into granite these volumetric shapes. But why? So, oh yeah, and also <laughs> Kapika, um, that big, big uh, cave we were looking at, the first cave, um, they realized that it fit exactly in the middle of a 120 meter radius. So the, um, again, yeah, the guys who are mapping this out, why they picked this particular cave, um, they did it and they aligned it to radiuses that go out crazy far. And this is in a remote part of India with a very, it's, it's up in the mountains, with sort of rocky terrain. So mapping out precisely where you want this thing to be aligned to. And the more we look into all of the sites, the, the alignments get more and more intricate. Um, they were able to do it over literally over 120 meters of rocky terrain with nothing but we can assume their eyes and hands and some tools. I can see why people think it was aliens because it does look like they were able to just sort of <laughs> come down. <laughs> now, Sudamar is, again, okay, well, it's one thing to make one room. Sudamar has two chambers. So you go in and you go into this first sort of squarish looking room and then you go through a second passage into a perfect dome, which looks like a mushroom. And this is, again, super complicated because the dome that's coming down, it actually has a lip underneath that is curved in itself. Again, all of this is polished, every single area of it. So we know from tests that you can polish, you can polish surfaces on the flat pretty easily, even like using sort of older techniques and primitive tools. If you work at a bit of granite and you get enough of um, some abrasive and some sludge, and if you go back and forth for about 45 minutes to an hour, you can start to get a really, really flat, smooth surface. But the minute that you start to go up, and let alone like curves, like that gets really difficult. You're playing with gravity and all these forces. To get that exactly smooth and aligned on curves is, well, we don't know, we don't know how they did it. And another thing is, again, it's like, wow, you're going to a lot of effort to um, make something precise Again, the human eye probably wouldn't read this, and it's showing up on the scans. The inside of the curved dome is mirrored on the, on the outside. No, there we go. So this dome is the perfect mirror of the inside sphere, which you don't know why you would need to do that, because you can't really tell if you're just running from one side and running to the other. Um, yeah, so here we go. You can sort of see there. So they've made a perfect replica. Again, it, why would you do that? Uh, why would you need to do that? Because it would be so much easier just to make a squared off room that goes into another dome. But for some reason, they really wanted to do that and they really wanted to do this curved lip. Now, all of the caves, of the seven caves, all six of them have these trapezoidal doors, door frames, kind of minimal, minimal aesthetic. I quite like it. And um, it's interesting because that's not typically seen in India. Um, door frames and doors tend to be squared off and then they have these beautiful, ornate, carved, um, kind of like heart-shaped um, doorways. Um, but where do we find trapezoidal doors but in Peru and in Egypt, uh, all the way back around the same time in post-2000 years? So just interesting, on the other side of India, in a remote mountainside, somebody's making doors that match those of Peru in Egypt. Um, here again, if you're aware of the uh, Serapium, the boxes in, the, in Saqqara, Sudama has um, corner points, polished corner points, um, that if I didn't realize that this was ancient India, I would think that was Saqqara. Again, Sudama has 87.1% plus three tenths of this uh, 
a curved wall. Again, why it's so much harder to do it on a curve. And also to remind you that whoever's making this, they have one shot of doing this. Because if you mess up, and if Barry makes 82 degrees, like it's over, it's all, it's not, it's not gonna work. So that you have well, one shot, you have one job, and they nailed it every time in every cave. You've got Vapiaka, which is this cute little one, um, super shiny. And again, with the 87 point um, one tenth perfect inverted on the wonk walls. Um, and, oh, and then this also has inverted walls the other way, so they're, they're making it super inverted. This, again, uh, the longitudinal symmetry is amazing, even if it's conservative. Um, nearly 70%, 75% when you do it that way. Um, Vatatika. Vatatika is made up of perfect circle and square. But the, um, it really annoyed me because the, uh, the, the passageway to go in is, is, is on the wonk. And I'm like, why, why would you... Why would you do that? It's almost like, oh, I've got an OCD. I want it all to align perfectly. Um, but again, they did that for, for a reason. And uh, when they were looking at the scans, they realized that the, the circle and the square actually it, it, um, translates to a perfect sphere and cylinder. And the volume is equal, precise. Again, it just looks like a bloody CAT scan had done this or a 3D printer. And Vedatika is interesting because it's got, um, an, it's not just an arc, it's there's three centers to the arc. So, you, uh, so whoever was carving this out had to make sure, again, in the one go, that he hits this arc perfectly, and then they curve, and then they hit this arc perfectly, and then the third one. So I think they were just showing off how cool they are at this point. Um, and again, the volume uh, in the spheres are just like, Amazing. I'm not a super maths person, so I'm just going to go with them like, well, yeah, the volume, yeah. But apparently this is like really, really cool. So the passageway being on the wonk, like it felt weird to my eyes, but it's really important because, and they only noticed this when they went back and did the more detailed scans, because this is not something that's available to the human eye, because um, Vapiaka and Vadatika are uh, kind of on opposite sides of one of these whalebacks, um, the, big, the big mountain lump. And the entranceway at 85 degrees cuts across precisely through the opposite cave. And then where that intersects, it's north, south, east, west. It is aligned perfectly to north. So it, they, they were, that's when they realized, oh, these caves are starting to have relations to each other. They're not just individual shapes. Um, there's something going on between, between all of them. And again, you wouldn't see that if you were just visiting and running around. So again, how, how did they do that? How did they line that up? There'd be somebody running over the mountain with rope and chalk, and yeah, it's amazing. Um, Karan Chopper, which has a near-perfect floor rectangle. Um, this one, I think, has been, um, the, there's like a kind of bench in there, granite bench, and at some point, we think that uh, there's been a bit of uh, recycling, reusing, um, of, these, of these caves. They were used historically um, by the Ajavika, um, the sort of common people um, of the area. So I think there's been animals kept in here and all sorts of stuff. So um, it is amazing that they are still in the condition that they are and they are still showing up so precise on the scans. Um, but again, Karan Chopper fits the thing of the 89, of the inverted things. And again, the, um, the maths that it uses to, to work out the shape it's, they're going through the floor and they're, in, they're making these shapes that are, half of them are available above the ground and half are in, underneath. Okay, so this is Lomash Rishi. This is the one cave out of the seven that has the more typical aesthetic of uh, India. You look at that and you're like, yeah, ancient India, great. Um, and so the team wanted to check the, the stonemasonry work, the craftsmanship, and they were like, let's analyze Lomash Rishi and let's analyze um, the other, the, all the other caves. And so they asked some independent stonemason experts. They flew them out, and they got them to analyze everything and say, you know, what do you think um, of this work compared to this work? And they all said, it, without a doubt, they would put their professional names on the line, and they did in the movie, that the, the work on the outside of Lomash Rishi 
um, it is not even comparable to whoever it was that made the insides of the caves. The, it was like visibly bendy and wonky to the eye. The actual, um, the actual thing isn't even aligned properly straight. You could draw a line down the center and it's actually, you can see, you can kind of even see with your eye, they haven't even lined it up with the actual door frame itself. It's sort of like this. Um, so it's beautiful to look at, but it's just the categorically not the same person. So that implies that these, potentially, when we're looking at the historical timeline and trying to un unravel that, that Lomas Rishi was later trying to be like repurposed or recycled, uh, but it was not the original people who turned up and did all the other ones. And now inside Lomas Rishi, this is one of the unfinished ones. And so this, again, this has all the clues, you can get your detective glasses out, um, because we can see how it might have been made, or, or you can flip the other way and be the argument that it was being recycled. So you've got the raw ceiling and a raw floor. However, the walls are polished, which, again, all the stonemasons were like, you would never do that. Um, you would never, ever, ever. You Polishing is the very, very last thing you do. You make sure you get your shape absolutely perfect, and you map it out, plan it out, you execute it, and then you polish. Um, so the idea that they would polish the walls, and, the, and the, just to give you a kind of time frame, historically, these things take about 12, 15 years to make. That's a conservative, rushed effort if you're hand polishing and hand carving the whole of these spaces. So you would spend the best part of a decade making these walls and then start again on the ceiling. And this is why you wouldn't do that, because whoever was carving the ceiling out accidentally was chipping in to all the beautiful polish work of the walls. So that made the team go, yeah, we think, we think that this was probably being redone or somebody was attempting to finish, if it was left unfinished at some point, but um, they, were, they were maybe restyling um, one of the caves and then they realized, oh, actually, crap. <laughs> we're messing up, we can't do it, and then therefore it was left. Um, again, outside Lomas Rishi, you see these sort of chop marks, which you can see in lots of sites in like um, ancient Egypt, and they're really common. They are like stonemasonry tools, people just making sure their blades are sharp. Um, but you only find them at Lomas Rishi. They, there's no tool marks or workers' um, evidence anywhere. So it's like they literally came, made these perfect caves, and then pissed off. Um, and <laughs> apart from Lomas Rishi, <laughs> where we can see evidence of people doing you know, more, more common work. Um, and I wanted to point this out. So this is in the unfinished dome of Lomas Rishi. You can see there's some sort of circular tool mark. And if you are aware of the work that um, uh, ben from Uncharted X is doing. He's looking into the uh, pre-dynastic vases, the granite vases that are... I think these Barbar caves and the granite vases are of a similar... Not that I'm saying the same people made them, but that very, very similar craftsmanship and skill set and possibly tools. And um, this, to me, looked like the inside of the, these carved granite vases. It looked like a similar, whatever they were doing to make the dome. And I'm, I'm wondering if we can crack one or the other, we might be able to help the other site out on how this thing was made. Okay, now this is where my strong suit isn't, doesn't come in. I barely pass maths at school. But... We find two measurements inside um, Barabar. There's a Barabar yard, they've decided to call it, because it's a measurement of 85.4.11 centimeters. Um, and if you whack that in a circle um, and chop it into six, one sixth of that is 44.72. If you square that, it makes the meter. So you find meter measurements and Barabar yard measurements. Now, meter measurements is odd. I mean, it, meter turns up in other places in the world. They're in uh, Puma Puku, the, the, the H blocks are like a perfect meter. Um, you find it in the king's chamber. But people are like, yeah, cool, so what? There's, um, oh yeah, so Sudama is um, 11 meters by six meters, two meters and one meter. They, they find precisely the meter in, in the caves. But the meter wasn't invented until like the 1760s. 